Hi there. Welcome back to Storytellers. I'm your host, John Harkness. I am the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books. And tonight we will be, oh, you can't tell it's nighttime, can you? Well, whenever you're watching this, we are going to be talking about books and writing with the lovely and talented and poetical and makeup guru and cover artist extraordinaire, Natanya Barron. Hello. Natanya, thanks for hanging out with us. Hey, thanks for having me. You're cool people. Yeah, we try. You know, it's, it's good to see you. Um, normally, we would have seen each other a couple of times at conventions by now. Yeah. But we're on now month three of since my last convention. Wild. Which makes me twitch just thinking about it. Because <laughs> normally I'd have six or seven conventions in that kind of time. Right. Um, and for you, you travel a lot in your other life. So the idea of being homebound for this long. That's, it's, it is tough. I uh, was supposed to be leaving for, um, for London this week. And if you know yeah. anything about me, I love London. London is like a person to me. I feel cities are like people to me. And uh, I'm very, very, very lucky and blessed and charmed and all this stuff to be able to work a job where I get to travel a lot. And I, yeah, it's, it's all things considered a very small complaint. Right. But, um, but yeah, it is definitely a very uh, bittersweet. I like being sure. home with my family. That's kind of fun. But um, I do miss the adventure and energy of, I love big cities and I love being in strange places. So, and it does influence my writing as well. So it's, yeah. it's uh, pulling from a different place. London particularly influences your writing. London particularly, yeah. So let's talk about your writing career, which has had its ups and downs and wins and wefts. How'd you start? <laughs> well, I started writing novel length things when I was about 12 years old. But you um, called them short stories. No, no, no. No, no, novel length things. And what they mostly were was I would take movies or books that I were, was reading and I would rewrite them, uh, either fixing them or adding myself into the story. <laughs> okay. As 12 year olds, 13 year olds do. Um, the longest I ever wrote was probably about 30 or 40,000 words of The Stand by Stephen King. And I wrote myself into it or probably called her Tanya, which I often did because, you know, very, very you know, mysterious who that possibly could be. Right. Um, but I thought it'd be so much cooler if there was like a 14 year old girl in the story. I don't really know why. Um, yeah. I also rewrote uh, Young Guns with a young 14 year old protagonist as well. Um, no, I kind of like that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I can think, get I think behind it, that idea more. I think it could have worked. Um, yeah, I loved Cowboys. I loved Stephen King. I love fantasy. Um, I actually got into fantasy a little bit after that. And um, that's when I started writing you know, I never really wrote, I mean, I wrote short stories for school, but I always knew I wanted to be a novelist. I know you're shocked that I wrote long things. It's just yeah. you know, ne never a problem in me. Um, yeah. And so I started developing my own secondary worlds. And of course I did the nerd thing with the languages and, uh, you know, try to create my own language. My sister and I wrote um, the, the wonderfully titled Gateways to the Ring of Fire, which was a full book. I, it is somewhere. I mean, it's I've probably seen worse titles. Yeah, I know, right? Um, I've published worse titles. <laughs> it had a wizard named Ladorna Tell. Um, there was some question, and, and, and no, but there were talking horses, so you know how that goes. Um, but you know, uh, and then I went to college, and I thought I had to be a serious writer, so I started writing fiction, and I took creative writing classes, and 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 the good thing is, I mean, I was I was put through the ringer in a good way, right? You know, when you go to a good liberal arts school, you learn that just being a good writer is not enough. Um, you know, you have to write well and you have to write to the right audience and you have to write, I would write very creative papers and my teacher would be like, so this is all written really well, but it's not very academic. And so I had to learn <laughs> how to write academic papers. Um, I studied primarily the middle ages, um, went all the way through graduate school and it was really, um, and I love that stuff. And that stuff absolutely influences my work as well. I mean, a hundred percent. But it was really after I had my son that I said, screw all of this, like 
trying to be a serious writer stuff. Um, I like science fiction and fantasy and it's how I understand the world. It's what I like to read. It's like what I like to watch. I like swords. I like magic. Um, for me, it was primarily fantasy has always been kind of where I feel most comfortable. And I started just writing and I wrote my first novel, which I actually picked up the other day, which was a combination of like, some parts were so much better than I thought. And then some parts were so much worse than I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah. oh, he's a baby writer. You're so, like, there were some really nice descriptions. And then I was like, what just happened? Like, I don't even know if I was, sh in my head it made sense, but I hadn't really made it, made sense in the, in the, in the story. So yeah, I, I wrote this first, I had to finish it. I wanted to finish a novel. And I think that took me about two years of various drafts. And it was, I remember at the time feeling like I was growing so much as a writer that I couldn't get a consistent draft. It was like, I, I would level up so many times that the work would kind of fall apart under its own weight. I've heard that so, from other people. Yeah. So I, I eventually just shelved the book completely and started on something different, which was called The Alders Gate. And that was a steampunk secondary world book that I podcasted as a draft. Okay. And this was, this was about 10 years ago, 2009 or so. Okay. And somehow it caught on, like not hugely, but enough that it was a good enough story that people followed and listened to the podcast and liked the stories. I got and some. That was a time when that was a thing. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Because Scott Sigler was doing it a lot then, yep. and I think Scott Nicholson was doing. Mer Lafferty was really the one that kind of got me thinking about doing it. She's local to me here in North yeah. Carolina, and she was doing the same thing. And I was like, hey, this is just a draft. Um, you know, I just want to see, oh, it's going to be this vast trilogy and all that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I did that, and it was like, I kind of realized that I was further along in the process than I thought I was. Um, I had a really weird early success slash failure when a big six editor uh found the podcast and was like send me the book like i'm really interested in this i'd love to hear I, i'd love to you know look at the book and, and and talk more um shocker she never got back to me um but i spent like a year just kind of waiting because i thought for sure right this was gonna happen um it didn't in the meantime i started publishing short fiction which tends to skew dark and horror, uh, sort of dark fantasy horror uh, kind of stuff. Um, I love the Lovecraftian kind of things and um, creepy monsters and body horror and taboos and all kinds of fun stuff, um, which was good. And that kind of start building, having the bull spec group here in North Carolina right. was really instrumental in that. Um, Sam Montgomery Blinn, who's a friend of my heart. Um, yes, big supporter of Big, huge of supporter from me. He was actually my first CIFBA qualifying story was in bull spec. Um, which was a huge deal for me. I mean, that was, that was tremendous. That is and a huge deal. You want to know, you want to know my first civil qualifying story sale? What was that? I can show you. <clears throat> and he's off. And he's off. Do, 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 do. Or I think I can show you. Do, 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 do. Oh, here we go. <laughs> You know why I knew I could show you for relatively quickly? Why? Oh, really? Because it released friend? this year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I have, at this point in my career, had two CIFWA qualifying short fiction sales. The second one releases in a month. Wow. But we see, you never know. Like every, right. And I think people don't realize how weird that journey can be. Um, that was like my big goal, and I did that. And then my... Follow-up goal was once I realized that this book wasn't going to be really doing what I hoped to, I did the whole agent shop around and I got, and this was right as the market crashed and, and all the feedback I got was, this is really great, but I don't know how to market it. And I had, and a lot of it is I had a lot of queer themes. I know again, super, super shocking for you who publishes my work. Right. Um, I had an entire race of people that were agender. They just, they, they did not have a gender. I created a, 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 a pronoun for them and everything. And, um, you know, it just wasn't going to, it wasn't going to be the thing. And that's fine. I, I then sold uh, my first novel to Candle, Mark and Gleam and that mm -hmm. published in just about 2012. It was the very end of 2011. My goal was <laughs> to publish my first novel by the time I was 30. And okay. in 2011, I turned 30. So, um, yeah, 
because I was born in 81. Math is fun. Um, and so, but what was really interesting about that is that was a pretty stupid and not really important measure for anything. Um, I don't know. I think just ha, for, I guess I, I forgot to preface that having children really made me want to be honest with myself about who I was as a person. And part of me wanted these arbitrary deadlines as if that was something that was important. Oh yeah. And it's not. Um, well, no. Yeah. But I then, like because yeah. I had a very similar thing when I left my day job in 2012, it was because I was math is so bad. Um, 2012, I was 38. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I don't do this before I'm 40, I'll retire from this job. Mm -hmm. So I quit my day job. Last year, I got back to making the same amount of money I made at that last year of my day job. So yeah, and that and that was kind of sort of what I ended up, I was just talking to a friend today, actually, because we hadn't really seen each other in about six years. And she was saying, you know, I feel, I feel bummed our old, uh, our old uh, writers group, everyone else is publishing these books, and I really haven't. And I said, you know, to be honest, most of the last 10 years, I haven't been publishing much. Um, when my daughter was born in 2012, it was the same year that my son was diagnosed with, with autism. And my husband lost his job. Um, and Jesus. so I was the single income earner and dealing with a special needs child and an infant um, for about four years. It just was my life. And I tried to write a couple of things. Um, I occasionally was, inter you know, brought on for an anthology. I've done some gaming writing. That was the kind of stuff I could kind of manage that was, you know, small and not super deep, but I, I really didn't write much novel length stuff at all. I'd also sold a nonfiction book to a big six publisher and just had a very negative experience. I really came away, um, kind of looking at all the people talking about their advances and stuff. You know, we had a very sizable advance that was split between four of us, but the book was a massive failure. And because my husband lost his job, that money all went to making sure we didn't house. go destitute. Um, we yeah. were renting. We had two children, one who was racking up doctor bills. Um, the money doesn't last. We never will earn out on that book. And, you know, that's just the reality of it. So I really had a very bitter taste in my mouth about publishing and the creative process. Um, and had a lot of ideas, but just really was stuck. I'd, I'd been writing the sequel to the first book that I'd written, that I published, Pilgrim of the Sky, um, which is now Gods of Lindinium, as, which will be out by Falstaff Press in 2021, uh, July, I believe, almost a year from now. Um, that's the plan. But, uh, you know, that book was so hard for me to write because in the middle of all that time, my sister's best friend, who was like a brother to me, passed away suddenly at the age of 29. Um, he got a staph infection from pneumonia and died. And then my great aunt, who was my grandmother of my heart um, and one of my best friends in the world also passed away. And it just left me, sometimes you just have to accept that writing is not going to be happening. And, and sometimes for me, it can be stress relief or psychological therapy. Other times there was just nothing left in me to be able to do it. So if you look at my website, you'll actually see there's like this, there's this break. There's this significant break between when I was writing things and I was able to write Rock Revival, which came out from, uh, from Falstaff Books about two years ago, in July. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a fiction book that was not speculative at all. And it was really my way of dealing with, it was inspired by the music that my son and I share. And okay. listening to the music that we share, um, gave me this idea for the story and I, and I love music and I've been playing music my whole life. And it was kind of my love letter to, to all of that. Um, and then you found this publisher who's burnout rock and roll trash and you're like, I yeah. got a rock and roll book. I was like, okay, I'm in. Yeah. It's my best reviewed book so far to date, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's a good book. <laughs> thank you. But um, I've started the audio book on it, by the way. I, so I, 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 I wish, I, that, I I wish that the press had an idea of how to sell it. <laughs> Hey, it's out there and the people that have read it love it. It's the one book that my dad has read, which is really cool because oh, a lot of people cool. have a hard time with, you know, science fiction and fantasy and I get that. But the long story short, um, I met you and I started kind of going back to conferences after being really largely out of it for a while um, and just burned out on the whole experience. I've been going to Dragon Con for years and a lot of other conferences, but having these kids and having 
the special needs issues and being the single income earner for so long it was about three years of time that I was really the one doing all the, the heavy lifting. Um, not by any fault of my poor husband. I think he lost three jobs in, in th as many years for the most ridiculous reasons. We don't, well, I mean, we, we've decided first, we don't want the yeah. first reason is okay. It's 2009. Yes. Done. Yeah. Yeah, right. So and then you live in a tech centric yep. part of the country and those are notoriously volatile economies. Yep, yep. And and uh so so I kind of came out on the other side of that with uh actually the story that I've just about finished writing now. Um so it's called Cinderglow. And it is a large secondary world fantasy that really came out of my response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Really? So, yeah. So in about 2016, um, when lots of things happened, I kind of started writing again. And uh, at least writing, I wrote Glass Mirror in between that, but that took like five years. I mean, nothing, nothing took, my usual is like about a year for a novel, mm -hmm. um, a couple of months for a novella. Uh, but I started right before... Um, I started talking to you, which was about 2016, um, started this book. And I really wanted this idea that an entire race of people was used as a, as the, the building blocks, their magical powers for a, another religion. So the exploitation of an entire people was used as the backbone of a religion. And so I built out this whole story is very, I, I say it's lost meets game of Thrones. So it's, it's, it's sort of a Regency period, so there's blunderbusses and guns and ships and ex exploration. Age. So the, the, the fantasy world is discovering itself, right, at the same time. Um, but it's also got kind of lost elements. So there's multiple timelines. I have a murder board <laughs> over there <laughs> that has all the things attached to all the things. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that is almost done. I had to take a, a lot of breaks from that in the last couple of years. But um, I'm happy well, with that. We had to take that. a few breaks to write a couple of books. Exactly. And I did. And, and, and that, and that was the cool thing. I actually remember um, exactly where I was when you emailed me and you said, uh, we have this idea for some novellas that are connected to the Harker verse. Uh, would you have an idea for anything? And literally it just came out of my brain. I remember I typed it out on my phone, which I almost never do for long emails and Narissa and Vivian just kind of showed up in my head. And uh, yeah, and now I've published over the last three years, three different novellas, which is now in the omnibus of These Marvelous Beasts. And um, that was such a wonderful, it was a wonderful series because I was able to do humor, mm -hmm. but also do some pretty deep commentary um, and keep it light, but also, you know, have, have a little bit of a stronger arm sometimes, but also use my love of travel i got to feature things in, in cities that i'd actually been to which is super cool um with my company so it's kind of fun if, if people who work with me can read it and know that oh we had that meeting there and you were writing about that place and um you know that was a really it was a great project to have over it was really over a two-year writing period so and i mean really I, through time what's that it bounced through time yeah yeah so it's over a 30-year period in the in the series and um painfully queer stories but that's okay I, I that's i think it's it made sense a lot of it i think it's an exploration of queerness and an otherness and well in giving me the marketing tagline of lesbian lamia love story yeah i couldn't ask for anything better to put on twitter yeah and it works and and you know um ultimately the story really asks what monsters are yeah. and and part of the end of that is really that monsters are the things that don't appear appealing to humankind. That if you look at the track records of almost every pantheon in the world, they're the ones creating the monsters and making things horrible and ruining things. It's not the monsters themselves. So um, that was really what I wanted to take away from that story. And um, I was really happy with how that turned out. I really, I really love the characters. I'm not done with them yet. I do want to tell more of their stories. Um, and the people that, that have reached out to me who've read it, you know, they, it's, diff, it's something different. And that's, I mean, that's really all I want to be able to do as a writer. You know, I, I like to be able to write things that are not an easy elevator pitch necessarily. And certainly not many people are writing about lesbian lamias. No, but I do reference back to that in the Harker book that uh, I'm working on that's coming out in July. Oh, cool. There is a reference because I now have a lamia in the present day Harker verse. 
And he's like, yeah, I've never met a Lamia before. Mm-hmm. There used to be one around in, there used to be one in the States, but I wasn't here then. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And that's been fun too, to be kind of connected to the other stories that everybody else has written. And I, and I love the idea of shared worlds. Um, my first book actually though, through, through you was a Broken Cities novella, which yes. was Wothwood which was my attempt to write a heroic fantasy in under 40,000 words. I which think it was, you did. Which I did. I think it turned out pretty well. And I've had, I have yeah. a couple of stands for Wolfwood. They're like, where's the next one coming? And I was like, the next one's a novel and I'm not quite ready to go there yet. <laughs> yeah, that's a book that, um, that's a book that was a lot more fun than I expected it to be when hmm. I started it. Because that book is it's really a lot of, it's a fun read. Mm -hmm. There's some dark shit. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, look at what I write. Yeah. And I try to, I try to balance it out. When I have a serious topic, I like characters that are a little unexpected or strange. And, and, and and that's kind of how that, that book balances out a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed writing that. And, um, I hope to write. I, I love heroic fantasy. I and I love. I, I love any time someone's given a sword. You know, like there's something just like, and and in this one, it's it's double swords, and and she's a chick, and and I also wanted to write kind of an an ambitious female character that isn't. You know, there's there's not there's not a romance in the story. It's not about her like you know bumping uglies. It's about her ambition and what her ambition drives her to, and there's a lot of decisions she makes that not everyone would have made. Um, and that that's that's kind of what drives her forward so it's and it goes into weirdness i love i love the weird, weird world as well so yeah so that that that's kind of where i got into the fall staff world um through that stuff yep. and now technically you're also tied into the bubba verse am i but, yeah because the bubba and harker universes are oh that's crossing right over right now so so now we can when we bring the when we bring the um the marvelous beasts into the present day we can have a bubba meets lamias wow i don't Uh, maybe the world's not ready for that i don't think i'm ready for that (laughs) i'm pretty damn sure bubba's not ready for that so before we got started you mentioned that you've been reading a lot yeah i have i really um I really felt that, uh, I think it really got me through the first two months of this, actually. I spent an um, uh, inordinate amount of time reading. I, I used to commute to work every day and listen to audiobooks. Mm-hmm. That's not an option. Um, yeah, I do, I do, are in the shitter, by the yeah, way. I do, I do a hike and listen to audiobooks, which, um, which is nice as well. Um, but yeah, I, um, I have, I have mostly been reading, um, very, easy to read stuff. Um, I, I did not go super deep. About a year ago, I decided that I wanted just kind of like light, like fantasy romance and fun stuff. Um, but I think the books over the last few months that I've absolutely fallen for, um, one is, they both have numbers in them. Um, one is Six of Crows by oh, Lee Bardugo. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've thrust it at quite a few people and been like, you need to read this and have this experience. Okay. Um, and you know, she's one of those writers that get, because many of us female leaning humans tend to get thrown into the YA bucket just because of the assumption that we are women. Um, but she, I would argue that her books are there. They don't feel like YA. I haven't read, um, her stuff before Six of Crows, but Six of Crows. I read it all. (laughs) (laughs) I read read Six of Crows. I mean, basically one can make the argument too, that like people in those kinds of worlds age very differently than they do in these world and today, you know what I mean? The age didn't trip me up. They could have been any age and they were such well-drawn characters and the plot was just so delicious. And the, you know, the back and forth, of 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 banter and the building of the worlds even though six of crows kind of takes place um it's not excuse me, it's not the first in her grisha first book so it's like a place that's only mentioned in the first other books right. you don't have to have read them um, but uh and they're fine they're not I mean, six of crows really is kind of a masterpiece it, it just and it's so good. and and crooked kingdom is is a fantastic follow-up um and i read the the Nikolai duology. And I, I, I basically just went through this period where I read everything she had ever written. 
Um, that she, by the way, for those of you watching at home, is Lee Bardugo. Sorry, did I not say that? L-E-I-G-H-B-A-R-D-U-G-O. Yeah. Yeah. And she's amazing. She's also yeah. super nice. And super woke, which is also very that. nice. <laughs> and you can see that in her books. I think one of my favorite things about Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom is that there is uh, a queer relationship and it is not a big deal. I mean, it is just treated with the the levity and the joy of falling in love with someone and all the fumbles and all the weirdness and miscommunications that happen in any other relationship, which is actually, I think, one of my favorite uh, Rebecca Sugar quotes is that when they were talking about writing Steven Universe, the whole point was to write queer characters that were allowed to have the innocence and joy of first love and romance because everything about queerness is sexualized and put in terms of you can't trust bisexuals, you never know where they are, you know, all this kind of stuff that becomes, you know, yeah. or there's, there's, there's erasure on all levels, there's, you know, stereotypes all over the place. And I remember hearing that and feeling like that is such an important thing for, for, for queer youth to know, is that they are allowed to have beautiful, simple, wonderful romances that are their own. Paul Barrett's uh, Whisper of Death, that mm -hmm. we published that, and the, we just came out with the sequel, A Cry of Decay. Yep. Mm -hmm. When I was working on Whisper, I had to email Paul and say that this, this is the sweetest, young, fur, baby gay love story I've ever read. Because it really is just two guys figuring out their way in the world and falling in love for the first time. And it's a super sweet story. And mm -hmm. like all of us, you can read in our writing what we're working through in our life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, Paul is not working through his first, his first love. Yeah. He's been married for a while. But, you know, we're all working through some stuff with the books. And you can tell that that book's very personal mm -hmm. for him. But the relationship between those characters is so, it's just so, so pure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's the saddest thing that is kind of taken away from queer youth, you know, by, by putting the line in their sand and saying, I am this, or I don't know what I am yet. You're excluded from, from that, which, I mean, I remember being confused myself because I, and I did, it took me to my thirties to be able to understand my own queerness after I was married, I kind of thought, well, if you get married to a dude, you revoke your queer card, right? That's not how, I didn't know that the, it, it, no one ever talked about that. No one, there was not a language for it, even though I was involved in, in, you know, queer advocacy and all kinds of stuff. I didn't know that I could count. Um, and, yeah. and I just didn't, I totally crushed on girls when I was younger. I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know who to talk to about that. I didn't, have a language for it and now i had a great conversation with my eight-year-old she's like i just haven't figured out what i am yet and i was like that's totally fine and she understands that intrinsically she also understands oh yeah there's a kid at school he used to be a girl but now his name is whatever and it was not hard for her right <laughs> you know this this generation that's hitting high school now and younger they understand so much shit that we didn't and you understand shit because you're about 10 years younger than me so you're you understand shit that i didn't mm -hmm. and stuff that you adopt adopt or adopted quickly took me yeah. longer um yeah and i've heard that same story from multiple folks who are figuring out their identity later in life as adults. I saw something on social media today where somebody said that it was a story of a woman coming, of a young girl, teenager, 14 or mm -hmm. so, coming out to her mother as yeah. bisexual. Mm -hmm. And her mom took a minute and thought and said, you know, I think I am too. <laughs> and that <laughs> happens. And that, and that, and that's, but that's because it's just not talked about. It's there, like I said, there, there, you have to make the language in some cases, you have to be willing to, and you, you might make mistakes too. It's interesting, just the term queer itself. Um, I know quite a few people who are not comfortable with that at all. Mm -hmm. And they are in the community and it's just, that's not what they, that, that is not, they were, that was used to them 
in a negative way, it was, it, you know, and it's okay. It's okay to say, you know, that's how I, and I tell people that, like, I don't mind. You just use that. That's fine. Um, right. Cause it is kind of this amorphous thing for me, you know, it, and it, it's super clear in my writing. If you read it, um, it shouldn't be a huge shocker, but, um, but not to say that's not complicated because it does raise questions, but it was great when my son said that he felt that he was probably, you know, he's, he's, he's questioning. And I was able to say to him, like, yeah, I did too. And as an adult, I've come to kind of an understanding and, you know, you don't have to be ashamed of it, but that was never a discussion in my household. Like right. they've gotten better about that stuff. But again, like there was never a time when it was like, do you feel like, do you want to talk about what you're attracted to? You know? Yeah. I grew up in rural South Carolina in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Um, I have had a lot of shit to atone for. <laughs> and that's yeah. okay. I mean, I, I grew up in a very strictly evangelical thing. I said horrible things about the queer community because that's what I heard around me. Um, right. I didn't know. And, and thankfully, uh, I, you know, I, it took me like one semester in college. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, you know, this is totally different. And it, what yeah. really came down to was when I learned that uh, the first four books of the Bible weren't actually written by Moses. Um, yeah. Really pissed me off. Uh, and, then, and then learning the history of the Bible and how the books came to be and sort of the linguistic, historical not to say that it invalidates anything. Simply, sure. I was I was told a story that was completely false, right. and and then I also had much longer story for another time. But I, <laughs> I I was able to see things that made me uncomfortable and say, this isn't right. This isn't love. And if this is what this is what this religion is supposed to teach, this is not going about it right. And yeah. you're right. So <laughs> like. Like we said, we're working through some shit. Yeah, and it's okay to work through it. It's okay yeah. that it takes time. If you don't think that I'm working through issues with organized religion, you've obviously never read yeah, anything right? I've, I've written. Yeah. Some of the things I think will never completely work out, we just at least yeah. get, our, get our minds around them a little more. Right. Yeah. So well, It's like one of the reasons I love medieval manuscripts so much. And if you follow my Twitter, you know that I share all kinds of bizarre drawings and things from I do very, yeah. both follow you and know that. <laughs> yes. Other people might not who maybe have made it this way through far, this way through this discussion. But one of the things I love is that there's such clearly a bizarre sense of humor in the medieval mind. We think of people in the middle ages as so serious and so devout and everything. And there's so much time. It's such a great, thing to focus on but there's so many buts john there's so many buts and so many phalluses and so many clearly not just embracing people and monkeys pulling fish out of their butts and then also putting them in their mouths and all in highly religious texts in books of hours all right <laughs> i've said those lines yep 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 exactly stood in the I have stood downstage center and made a Shakespearean reference to analingus. Yep. Yep. And if you read Chaucer, there's a thing called the nether E, and that means your nether eye, which means your bum hole. Yep. So, you know, and there's tons of farting in Chaucer and, you know, the the humanity is there. We've always been this way. And we're I mean, and queerness was not the kind of thing it really became politicized just like so much in the 1950s. Um, because there was there was a lot of progression that was made during World War II in the in in the field, right? Let's just say, um, there but there was in foxholes either. Yeah, so there was a decided difference to really you know make men men and women women and make America great again. This whole concept comes from the fifties um, when you know women's rights were being squashed and this idea that women shouldn't work and this woman you know that that men should be men, but it was okay if they were having their dalliances on the outside because you know make sure wives that your husband comes home to a perfectly coiffed dinner and a qu perfectly coiffed coochie because if you smell like anything put some lysol up your hoo-ha i mean it's like so screwed up that that was like the the whole culture of the time was just was an absolute horror really i mean there's a reason that writers like Shirley jackson and a lot of the the writers of that period wrote horror to to figure out their way through this post-war society where 
women had been working and doing amazing things and then it was just taken away. Yeah. Um, yeah, we know you saved yeah. the country. Thanks for that. But Bubba's back. So would you yeah. please get your ass in the kitchen? And you know, and your waist back? has gotten a little bit, you're a little bit poochy. So uh, let's, uh, you know, let's start measuring. I mean, I love that at the beginning of uh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel. Um, which I think is something that they get. She she spends the first one of the opening scenes measuring all her her measurements, her ankle, her her thigh, her because that's what women did. It was like you have to present this certain look to your husband. He won't love you anymore if you have babies and then gain weight, or if you you know are letting yourself go and your hair's not perfect. And it drove women crazy. I mean, and you can see it. They really talk about that in the show. Yeah, and and she really has a psychotic break, but it's with humor. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I mean, they do that a, a really good job of that. So yeah, it's uh, the last hundred years in our country has really just yeah. It's one of the reasons I have a hard time writing post nineteen twenty or thirty is because it's it is it gets so complex and it gets so difficult. I know my my grandfather um, was is, was Jewish and he um, he went to the war. He was a code breaker in World War Two, and he came back from the war an atheist, a hardline atheist. And he was the rest of his life. And um, when my dad turned 13, he said, Hey, do you want to have a bar mitzvah? And my dad was like, well, we've never really been to synagogue or anything. So no, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know what he experienced there. He never talked about it. Our, right. our, our, our culture didn't give voice to be able to have GIs to talk about that. And I think he was haunted for the, for his entire life. And it never, we will never know what he went through. Um, and that's heartbreaking. And I, and I, I, I have a hard time approaching that time because I know of that stuff. So that's it's a little bit of a derivation, but, or a, a deviation, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating world to know so much of what we're still dealing with now is really because of the fifties, um, and Jim Crow and this attempt to, <sighs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you look at the date that most of the Confederate uh, monuments were put up, it was not anywhere near the time of the actual Civil War. No, yeah. and it had nothing to do with honoring the Confederacy. No, I because mean, that was considered treasonous. Right. Like I said, I grew up in the rural South. Mm -hmm. I have the stories about my ancestors who fought in the Confederate Army and one was a prisoner of war, and at the end of the war, he was released from a POW camp in Baltimore. Mm. And he walked home to York County, South Carolina. Wow. Um, probably took a couple of months. But, yeah, that's the, that's the shameful part of my heritage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not proud of the fact that my people supported that shit mm -hmm. yeah and that's i mean that's something that i was talking about on twitter the other night when i had my rage fest is that i don't have those stories like my heritage my people only came to this country out of eastern europe and sweden and canada those wily canadians and granted there was colonialism and i'm, I'm not saying that in canada there was not any of that sure but the anglo-saxon the waspiness that is like I don't have any ancestors that fought in any of the world wars except for world war one and two, because they happened to be here and they were drafted. Um, I didn't, our people did not own slaves. Yes. There's tons to cop to in terms of native American shit and that's its own thing. But my, just because I don't have slaves or slave owning in my ancestry does not exempt me from white privilege. Right. People don't know that I'm French Canadian and Jewish. They think I'm Italian and that's okay. Yeah. But a hundred years ago, that might not have been okay. Oh, you know, right. People ask my mom all the time, what is she? And she's yeah. not anything. She's white. She's just a duskier shade of white. <laughs> that's what how, that's, my that's, daughter, you asshole. that's how, that's how, yeah, it's just so, so weird that like we, we do try to categorize people, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a white person. Um, and I have it, my difficulties in my life have never been because of the color of my skin. Right. And, you know, I was on a panel earlier today talking about art and politics, and it was, mm -hmm. and the panel I put together was Lauren Gilman and Dale Muhammad and Gerald L. Coleman and Michael G. Williams. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
hey, and before we start, I was like, so I'm going to ask a lot of questions, and then the middle-aged cishet white guy is going to not say a whole lot, because my story gets told all the time. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And that's, I mean, I stray from that in my own writing, because it's not that it's wrong. It's just that I, that's not the story that I, that I'm out to tell. Right. And um, I mean, most of my protagonists are cis hat white guys. Um, I write them from a little bit closer perspective mm -hmm. and I write a lot and I write fast. So there's a mm -hmm. demand on me writing a lot of shit really quickly, mm -hmm. but then it's my job to make my secondary characters as fully fleshed out, have as much agency, be as diverse as possible and not stereotype or tokenize. Right. Or, um, and when I started this career, I didn't think about that shit. Right. Yeah. I can't say that because my first novel, my, my, my first, fantasy novel the main character was a gay dude so <laughs> right and it was and that that was me that was like i wanted i didn't want a story with a, a heroic fantasy with a straight guy i thought that was just not interesting but very soon after i started writing more female characters more people who had a female experience or a woman's experience because mm. again i had not i had not really read much but we were talking about speaking of a women's experience we we're talking about Lee Bardugo yes. talking about <laughs> Six of Crows. I just finished Gideon the Ninth, Tamsin Muir, and I cannot get over how good this book was. Halfway through, I knew I was counting down the hours I was listening to an audiobook. The audiobook is a piece de resistance. It is. It really is. So phenomenal. I mean, the uh, her name is um, uh, Moira Quick. I want to be her someday. <laughs> her ability to make characters you know who they are by her tone of voice every oh god it's so amazing yeah. but one of the things i thought that was so cool about this speaking of queer characters is the main character gideon is a lesbian um mm -hmm. there's lots of genders and, and and sexual orientation are just kind of all over the place in a, in a very neat way um but her her crushes for lack of a better term are kind of innocent in spite of the fact that she's like a total badass. Yeah. I love that it was not, even though it's very violent and there's a lot of language and there's a lot of swashbuckling. But there not, is a certain naivete. Yeah, because she's like 17. In a negative way. Yeah, she's like 17, but she's a tough, hardened, you know, ninth house necromancer her support crew, you know, and she's a brute and she's got, she measures her biceps. Um, yeah. And it's, it is so phenomenal, and I like everyone else that the the sequels coming out, and I just can I, I haven't. Been, it's been a long time since I just like counting down the days. Like, please, please, please give me, give me this book. Um, some Have other you read Ninth House yet? Yes, I did. Yeah. What do you think of Ninth House? Um, it wasn't quite my bag. I think it's not really a genre that there were some things I really liked about it. There were some. Um, I, I don't want to give anything away because I think we could have a conversation about this without spoiling it, but there were some narrative choices that I thought were kind of strange. Um, and I kind I of felt, felt like it was more about setting up another book than it was that story. Yeah, I felt like, I felt like it was 90% of a really awesome book. And then the last 10% turned it into a book that had to have a sequel. Yeah. And I was like, yep. you know, if you had taken the last 10% of this book and added 10% and just wrapped the whole thing up. Yes. If, yeah. But, and I don't know, yeah. you know, she's obviously very successful. She's got contracts for a whole mm -hmm. bunch of shit. I don't know how the book was sold. I don't know if it was sold as a series or if it was written to this point and then Six of Crows got all this great acclaim and then they said, we're going to have to have a sequel to whatever you release. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But there were a lot of things I really loved and a couple of pieces where I was like, I really wish this wasn't a book with a sequel. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, but that, I guess that makes sense from the readership perspective, like you were just yeah. saying, if that's what people expect and that's what they get. Um, I would say the, the year before that, the best couple of books that I read, um, definitely an unkindness of ghosts by river Solomon, um, which is a space, a generational spaceship story 
which is not something that I ever, I am not a science fiction person. I was actually reluctant for getting in the ninth because it seemed like there were spaceships, but the spaceships are definitely like second banana to the fantasy aspect. Like 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, but uh, An Unkindness of Ghosts was one of those books that left a hole in my heart <laughs> when I was finished reading it. And um, the only other book that I think ruined me as much as that was Nnedi Okorafor's uh, Who Fears Death. Mm. Um, in terms of, I read that during the very difficult period when I was working and supporting the family and all that stuff. And I remember sitting in my car and just sobbing uncontrollably. And I don't cry very easily. Um, it's just not in my DNA, I guess. Um, but uh, it, it, it ripped a hole in my heart in a way that, never healed in a good way. You know, you want those books and sometimes, and I feel this way with Unkindness of Ghosts, I can close my eyes and it's like, I know the there's a specific feeling that I got reading that book. And it was like sustained the whole time. And when, when writers can do that and you're just, you're in this sense and there's a lot of anxiety and it's about, uh, it's, it's about race, it's about class, it's about gender, um, it's about access to things and the slavery narrative and it's all on a ship, but it's basically the ship has recreated almost the South, right? So there's white owners and then there's this whole slave class and it's about rebellion. I mean, it's perfect book to read right now if you want to understand this experience. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I get chills just talking about it because it, it, it completely, it's hard. I think a lot of what I've read in the last couple of months has been just candy. And part of it was that I was reading a lot of books that were like this, that and sometimes you can only let so much in. <laughs> but, I'm rereading a set of Valdemar books by Mercedes Lackey. So yeah, I'm with you. I'm totally popcorn reading right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. I'm not even reading new stuff. I'm rereading this series. And that's that's also totally fine. And we, you know, just as I believe in writing, forcing it is not the answer. Um, and it's okay if your body and your brain are saying not right now. Um, and 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 every book has its season. I think the uh, so we mentioned that. Gods of Lindinium, um, which I'm very excited is, has found a home with you, um, is another really big book, and that took a long time to write. Um, queer theme, surprisingly, but it's actually a, a, fan, a male protagonist written in the first person, which is also not something that I usually do. Um, but it took a long, long time to write, and it's really, I, I've been saying it's stretches of her regard meets American Gods. Mm -hmm. So if you take those two books and kind of put them together, that's very, very similar. And it takes place in Londinium in a London where the Romans never left. So there's a lot of talk about the, the Roman structures, there's uh, aqueducts, there's hanging gardens, there's, um, you know, it's, it's trying to build lots a world, gods. lots of gods. Lots of gods. Lots of gods, some good sex scenes. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed them anyway. I don't always put them in there, but I feel like when they, when they work, they work. And uh a big burly bear of a main character. I mean, I can't really descri describe him any different. Uh, and uh, he's, his name is Joss Raddick. If you read the first book, he's, he's in there toward the end and he's the godling of the sea. So he controls water and all things connected to that, but also horses and other things and kind of playing with the mythology. It took a long time to write that book. I mean, I think it's the longest I've ever taken to write a book. And I've rewritten it multiple times and finally came to a place where I feel mostly comfortable with. And, um, it's a, it's a sad, it's a melancholy book. I wouldn't say that there's funny moments, there's characters that are hilarious, but it really is about love and loss. And, and one of the ideas for me was, I love writing about sort of ancient characters and characters that live a long time, but when is too long? You know, when do you let go? That's, when is too much, too I've much? I've played with in a couple of books too. And it's, it's a question, it's, you know, it's the question you have to, I have to ask. Because mm -hmm. I tend to, I tend to write books about immortals. Me too, yep. You go a little higher up on the food chain because you write about gods, I write about vampires. Yeah. <laughs> I write about parasites. Um, but the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. What do you do when everybody you've ever known or loved is dead? Yep. How do you deal with that? And you know that you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what are the ramifications of your decisions? Yeah right what might be a joke can change the course of the world you know you can change something you have great power um i dealt with that a little bit by this idea that the godlings kind of diminish over time like the more they use their powers and and, and they can choose to die you can't it's very hard to kill them but they can kind of choose to let go when they let go they're reborn again and then another incarnation and that's kind of eventually i've always wanted to have eight of these books um the 
the I won't give away who the god is in the first one, but the, every chap every book would have because it's kind of a big reveal in the first book if you haven't read it yet. Um, it's very clear from the very beginning. It's I think the first words is like it is true. I am the gods of, god of the sea. <laughs> so it's 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 right out there, right in the first lines. But that every every book would have a character that was sort of its uh, its its main god and. Um, yeah, I've always loved those books. This was all in a secondary world that's all alternate history and it features the romantic poets, which are a huge influence. If you, if you read the Frost and Filigree books, there's a huge, uh, Lamia comes from John Keats and uh, the name Isabella is actually in, in Gods of Londinium. It takes from Isabella in the Pot of Basil. So I'm trying to constantly pull different names. Uh, of course, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, who is Vivienne Dulac, is another John Keats poem. Um, so there's a lot of that in there and uh yeah it just kind of pulls in my literary background but um you know I really I really wanted a love story but also like what happens after a love story I I'm, I've become very unsatisfied when a book ends with the culmination of being in a relationship because I've been married now for almost 16 years and it's definitely not like that yeah yeah I'm at 25 so yeah same deal yeah and there's 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 seasons of your relationship <laughs> and it is it is constant work and it's knowing that i mean i I think i think we're probably around the same age if we got because i got married at like 23 Mm -hmm. um yeah i was 22 i was pretty dumb and unformed as a human and to make a decision to be with someone for the rest of my existence as we had and i hadn't even figured out a lot of things about myself um yeah it's a lot of work and 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 the story is not in oh they lived happily ever after no and and i really wanted this story to be about that a bit. So. Yeah, the story is in figuring out who you're going to be mm-hmm. for yourself and for this other person. Right. Because now you've you're taking you and this other person are going through all these changes together. Yep. But my wife is not- my wife and I are pretty close in age. She's a couple of years older than me. So we were figuring out how to be adult humans together. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you don't know how that's going to change each of you individually. Right. And, yeah. and that's, and that's why, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but a lot of people I know are getting divorced these days um, because yeah. being forced to be with someone that you haven't figured this out, but it is, it is a ton of work. And it's, I'm lucky that I married someone who's as geeky, if not geekier than I am, that we <laughs> both, we both value each other's independent time. Um, we have made a commitment to raising our son together. Um, and that's, a, the divorce rate among kids that have the parents that have kids in the spectrum is through the roof. Um, and we knew that we could not do this without each other. And we've made, we've, we had some rough years, but we've gotten through it. Um, and I really, I think I like, I like, I do. I like, I like romance novels I, as much as the next person I actually recently kind of discovered some of the fun ones out there. I really like uh, Grace Draven who writes a lot of, kind of like monsters into romance and, and atypically looking people into romance, which is kind of nice. They're not all like huge Jack dudes and, you know, ladies. Um, they're, they're like normal people, but they have very passionate erotic relationships with so it, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, but not to say that that stuff's not important. I do like to have elements of the romance, but I wanted to just make sure that the stories and, and almost in everything that I write, it's not always about that in, in, the Frost and Villagery books, relationships kind of come and go. There's, yeah. they've all kind of had, what's that, that? And morph. And morph, right. And even one of the characters, there's a, a queer character who has a crush on someone who she does not know could be. That character ends up falling in love with someone in a same-sex relationship later because I didn't want the, the horrible stereotype of if two gay women are around each other, they're automatically going to be in love with each other. And I I purposely did that. And no one's upset. Like at no point in the story does the person go, but I had a crush on you for 400 years. And it's because I wasn't in love with you. Like, yeah, it wouldn't have mattered. It's not, it's not about that. So, so yeah, that's, 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 that's that. And I'm, 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 Joss's story is really dear to me. And again, I think I was, two people that I love very much died while I was writing it. And I think a lot of it is learning to let go. Um, there's a character who passes away. And at first I had a very sudden death, you know, like one of these, like just something happens and they're gone. And I actually, in my revisions decided to have a period of fading Mm. because that is so much what so many of us have to deal with that. It felt more, 
it kind of honored my experience a little bit more to, to deal with that uncomfortable space when you don't know from day to day and how the grief process is, is delayed and you have these moments of hope and then they don't follow through and then, right. then it's over. And, and that. And then you're dealing with a different flavor of the grief process, mm -hmm. which yep. has its own ups and downs. And it doesn't ever really go away. No. It just changes. Yeah. So I mean, both yeah. of my parents died after long illnesses, mm -hmm. but my brother-in-law died suddenly in a car accident. So, mm -hmm. and my uncle killed himself. So I've seen the whole spectrum. Yeah. I have too. Sucks. It all sucks. It all sucks it all in different sucks. ways. Yep. And, um, and I, and I think that's not something that, especially in fantasy, I think we kind of hand wave a lot of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> And I wanted, I wanted it to be uncomfortable and I wanted it to be without resolve that there, that just somebody went away and yeah. they're gone now and there's a lot of loose ends and. Yeah. The character you know. I killed off in the black Knight Chronicles, like he died of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and he was diagnosed in book two and died in book five. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, for anyone who's had people, fade from cancer. That's can how be how it is. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the last thing that's coming out, which is actually coming out this year. Um, and that's a fun story too, in terms of when I wrote that. So, um, I wrote queen of none, which I joke is my thesis that I would have written in graduate school if I could have written fiction and it is my Arthurian story. And it's all told from the point of view of the historic sister of Arthur named Anna, who's in the oldest versions of the Arthur poems that you can find, who gets completely overwritten um, by Morgaine and Morgaz and Elaine and all these other fancier yeah. half sisters that kind of show up. But she's the biological full sister of Arthur. I've never and heard of her. Most people haven't. Um, and I remember finding her in graduate school and thinking that, wow, first of all, her name is just Anna, which is like, <laughs> it's a very old name, but it feels... Yeah. It feels kind of like, oh, she's just this person. Um, but I really kind of wanted to do this version of the Arthur tale, because I love Arthuriana, um, from the point of view of a woman who really would never be able to even leave the castle. So she's married off at 12. She has her first child at 13, who's Sir Gawain of fame, of the Green Knight, and then has twins, who are Gareth and Gaharis. And by the time she's 30, she has 20-year-old sons. <laughs> in her early 30s who are full knights and who are doing the thing and her husband dies and she's sent back to Camelot and she's married off against her will again and has to stay there and so she, her whole thing is the intrigues and the whole world of Arthur is happening around her and she's in the very middle and so this whole book is about all the things that happened to her and weaving in my favorite stories into her story and she's a, it's a first person narrative she's not always reliable um i joke she's a pretty shitty mom um and she has a vendetta against merlin she thinks merlin gave a prophecy when she was born that said in all the in all the ages and in all the hearts of men you will be forgotten and so uh she kind of finds that she has her own ability she's kind of from a long line of witches she didn't realize and she's able with her tumultuous sister relationships to kind of harness some of that um, my favorite scene includes the Lady of the Lake is Vivian, um, another Vivian, but this is Vivian of the Lake, and she's a blacksmith. <laughs> I wanted instead of the instead of the sword coming out of the middle of the lake, I have an island like in the middle of the lake where there's a blacksmith, um, okay. and sure. and you know playing around with the tropes like that. Also, again in the earliest stories of Arthur, uh, Guinevere's three people. There's three Guinevere's that Arthur marries in succession. So in this book, it's three different sisters that are all their names are all derivations of the name Guinevere um and so I, I wanted to mix kind of old and new but the the actual kind of look and feel is more like the sort of uh pre-Raphaelite version of Arthur like I wanted this very like I'm sure you're shocked very lush and lots of beautiful costumes and kind of almost nondescript more like a secondary world than than it is in history because then it gives you a lot of freedom that you wouldn't have if you're trying to like make it in 627 or whatever. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I wrote that book right after I wrote Pilgrim of the Sky. So 2010, 2011, um, I wrote and, 
I, I sent it out to agents. I got a requested full within the first three emails I sent thought that I was going to, you know, change the publishing industry overnight. Um, never heard from that person and just kind of shelved it. I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I wrote the whole most, the first draft I wrote in about a six week period right after my sister's cancer diagnosis. And it was what I did to keep sane because my mom had survived cancer. My dad's been ill since I was five and to have my sister have cancer at 23 was just a little much for me to take. Um, but over the years I kept pulling it out and I would go, you know, I just, I'm not ready to trunk this yet, but I don't know what to do with it. So I'd put it back and I would, you know, I, I would edit it again. I would go through and make changes and I would always get to the end and go, I'm just not ready for it. And, um, then Joe McDermott, who I've known for a long time, just sent me an IM was like, Hey, we're looking for books at this press that we're starting vernacular books. I was already in the way of the laser, which was the series uh, the anthology they put together. And I said, Hey, I've got this book. I have no idea if it's something that you'd want to publish. Um, take a look at it. No harm if you don't. Um, and within a couple of weeks, they were like, we absolutely want this. And I just got my editorial letter back, which is always fun. And it was just this, it was a great feeling because they really got it. And Eric uh, Borsarge, who's the editor, his favorite scene of the book, the book that he, the book that the scene that made him want to buy the book was my favorite scene. And I was like, awesome. that's just really cool. Like you get yeah. it and you understand it. It's a lot. If you've read Circe uh, or know of the book Circe, which was uh, written all about the, you know, the, the witch Circe, the sorceress in, um, Greek mythology. It's very, it's similar to that in the feel. So um, it's not super long. It's like 320 pages or so. Um, and I've got the cover I'm going to reveal soon. I just, it's been kind of weird to do that kind of stuff right now. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> haven't done that, but you know, she's a, she's a, a mother protagonist with grown children. She's past her prime. Um, and she's in the middle of all of this and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the story and I'm, I'm excited to get it out there. So it's been fun to re-examine my medieval roots and kind of realize that I, you know, I, if, if school was a thing you could just do, I would probably still be in school, but school is expensive. And yeah, I, I was going to say, money. it is a thing you can just do. It just costs a ton yeah. of money. And, and I turned out writing and marketing made me enough money to support my family. So that's, you know, I, I balance the two and I'm, I, I chip away at it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. That, that Arthur book sounds like so much fun. I love the King Arthur mythos. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that. You don't say. Uh, huh? <laughs> I said, you don't say. <laughs> Pretty sure you have a few things that, that pull from some of that. So. Yeah. I might have a couple of things going that I need to take a look at. <laughs> um, so thanks for spending some time with me. And with us, Anytime. with everybody out there in internet world. Um, and how can people find you on social media? How can people find yeah. you online? So I am most active these days on Twitter just because of the state of the universe. I've felt like no one really wants my newsletters and my long blog, blog posts on things. So if, if you go to at Natanya Barron, uh, you'll find me there. My website is also natanyabaron.com. My Instagram is also at Natanya Barron. Um, and my Facebook page is Natanya J. Barron because somebody else had it, uh, that wasn't me, but, um, those are the places that you can find me. Um, yeah. And if you'd like to get eBooks of any of the stuff that we've released of Natanya's, you can go to falstaffbooks.com. There are links there. You can search by author name. Mm -hmm. And if you would like print copies of rock revival and these marvelous beasts you can order print copies from the yeah. falstaff books website yeah and i and i would say my other stuff that is not through falstaff if you go to quail ridge books in raleigh or flyleaf books in chapel hill their websites or indie bound you can get copies of those as well so i prefer you go through those methods if possible yes just so tell them get i get out called. there and get out there and buy stuff yes. so thank you natanya and i will talk to you soon all right. Thanks, John.